Hello and welcome to Formula Phil. Hello, hello. All right, guys, how are we doing? Today, we're going to be doing a driver not known for his sheer talent and driving ability, but all the same is known as a complete and utter legend. And that is the great Taki Inoue. Taki Inoue was a Formula One driver that competed around the mid 90s and he is now kind of a cult favorite and as I mentioned earlier it's not due to his driving talent or you know immense skill it's um, kind of because he was involved in two peculiar and highly unusual Formula One incidents unusual incidents which we will look at later but he is also known certainly now anyway for a brilliant uh, self depreciating Twitter account and he openly admits and says himself that he was in fact the worst driver to ever compete in the sport. But after spending some time researching the man, I have to say there's a lot more to him than that. Inoue was born in Kobe, Japan in 1963. And it was his long-standing lifetime ambition to be a Formula 1 driver. Inoue religiously bought Formula 1 magazines in Japan. And he deducted that to get a step closer to his dream, that he would have to go to the UK to compete in Formula Ford. He began almost working day and night as a waiter in Japan. He finally saved enough money for a one-way ticket to London. He later admitted that this was the first time he had ever set foot on a plane, and certainly the first time he ever left his homeland of Japan. And after much confusion at the check-in desk and even at security, he somehow managed to board the plane. And in his innocence, when they brought out the in-flight meal, Taki started to panic and realized, geez, I haven't got enough money for this. So he kind of nervously drew out his wallet and asked, how much is the cheapest thing you have? And the air hostesses, of course, started laughing at him and were like, you don't have to pay. It's a long haul flight. It's included in the price. Relieved and panic over that that potentially budget-busting expensive meal was now free, he said he ate as much as he could. And when the plane landed in London Heathrow, he marched straight over to the information desk, announcing that he was going to be a racing driver and where he should go. And after, of course, a ridiculously long delay and massive confusion on both parties, he was told about new market race course. So he set off boarded a coach and on arriving there he was informed that yes this was a race course but it was horse racing not car racing despite all these setbacks and all this confusion and really one can only imagine how awful that whole experience could be he decided to stay on and he actually got himself enrolled in snetterton's race school and later even graduating to formula ford but, to be honest, he wasn't known as a top racing driver. When he did finish the races, uh, the results weren't all that great, often finishing around the 19th and 20th out of 24 racers. After a large crash in Formula Ford, he returned to Japan where he competed in Formula 3000 for several seasons. Though, he had a remarkable ninth at the Estoril circuit in Portugal. At this stage, it is to be noted that Taki may not have the driving skills, but he was a magnificent talker, certainly had the gift of the gab, and he got his first F1 drive at the Japanese Grand Prix in 1994 by perhaps coercing or blagging his way for a one-off deal to race for Simtech, but perhaps it wasn't the glorious F1 debut he would have imagined, because he crashed after three laps during a heavy downpour. And in fact, he actually crashed on the pitch straight. Undeterred, and now appetite whetted, he talked himself into a massive sponsorship deal with Unimat. Unimat being a vending machine company, which I am told that you can find their vending machines on almost every street corner of Tokyo, Japan. Now, with this extremely lucrative backing, cash-strapped Footwork Arrows team decided to give him a go. And now his dreams are finally coming true. Taki is now a fully fledged Formula One racing driver. Though his first four races didn't really go to plan, he spun out and he also had a couple of engine fires. But all that disappointment couldn't really crush his dreams because his Formula One idol was in fact James Hunt and he really went for it with the old kind of bohemian lifestyle. Though he admits he didn't have much luck with the women, he said he was drinking a hell of a lot. And though it was great fun, 
He said that he found it extremely hard to drive a Formula One car with a severe headache. Though there might have been another reason for all this drinking. In other interviews I read, Tacky was scared, very scared, because he had never driven a car so powerful or so frightening as a fully-fledged F1 car. Footwork Arrows kind of didn't trust him to test or set up the car. They basically said, in as many a words, that you get to drive the car, take it or leave it. So incredibly, he had very little time to test, obviously, or familiarise himself with this brand new car. He was often just, well, literally just sent out there on race weekend. And actually, at the Brazilian Grand Prix, he now merrily admits that he didn't even know the procedure for a pit stop. That no one in the team had actually told him. He really was on a kind of figure it out yourself basis with the lads. But it was at the Monaco Grand Prix where he was involved in his first of two extremely bizarre Formula One incidents. During practice, Tacky had run wide near Mirabeau and he had actually stalled his car. A recovery truck arrived and proceeded to tow him back to the paddock. Whilst the tow was in place, a Renault Clio course car came flying around the circuit, unaware that the rescue operation was going ahead. The Clio came flat out around the corner, only to find Taki Inoue's F1 car being towed by a trundling lorry. Having nowhere to go, the Renault Clio slammed into the side of poor Taki Inoue's F1 car. The footwork rolled over, causing the tow cables to slice clean through the chassis, right through the top and almost off Taki's head. Fortunately, though he wasn't wearing his seatbelts, he still had his helmet on, which was apparently crushed. And it is still thought that it's a miracle that somehow he wasn't harmed. Later in the year, at the Hungarian Grand Prix, something even more bizarre happened. His engine caught fire and he stopped at the side of the track. He gestured towards the marshals to come on, put out the fire. But he obviously didn't think that they were reacting fast enough, so he jumped out of the car and ran to seize a fire extinguisher. But as he ran back towards his car, he did not notice that the Tatra safety car was coming over the grass towards him. And he was hit, struck violently, and he was flown up on the bonnet, and he somehow landed on his feet, still holding the fire extinguisher. But it is true, later he did collapse. He admits that he was hit very hard, and he was expecting to be taken to the hospital by the helicopter. But he was told that if they used the helicopter, they would have to stop the Grand Prix. So he had to actually wait until the finish, which was another hour. He patiently waited. But he said he was in agony, and he was eventually taken to hospital. But once he arrived, he was amazed by the doctors and nurses looking for his credit card. He was like, what? I don't have my credit card, I'm in my race suit. But the hospital were insisting that he paid first before he received treatment. After a long and no doubt painful negotiation, they finally agreed to treat Tacky. And they later found out that he in fact broke his leg in two places. What's amusing about this story is in fact Tacky never paid. In fact, he joyously regales that they keep sending him the invoice and he just ignores it. Concerning, I guess, I suppose we could call it the Hungarian incident, he says that he was so desperate for the fire extinguisher because they only had one monocoque and if fire had damaged that, he might not be able to race in the next few races. Though, I'm sure it really wasn't worth being run over for. In fairness, the rest of the year kind of went by without incident. And the following year, the following season, it looked certain he was going to drive for Minardi. But somehow, his backing, his sponsorship just pulled out last minute and he was left without a drive. He did a brief stint in sports cars, but he also looked at IndyCar. He headed over to America and took a private test. And at Indianapolis, he said, and I'm quoting him directly here, he said, no way would I do IndyCar. I don't have the balls for it. I was out there and I nearly shat myself. Retired from racing and now living in Monaco, started a small company that helped young Japanese drivers. In fact, he even ran a small racing team in Italy. And he also was involved in a large mining operation in Africa. Taki has since earned popularity from making jokes related to Formula 1 and also at himself and his driving ability on his Twitter account. And though he and others can now poke fun at you know, his lack of skills or his uh, self-proclaimed world's worst F1 driver, but 
you gotta hand it to him. He lived his dream, and I find that remarkable. Yet he probably didn't have the talents that other people did. He went out there and he got it. And for that, that's why he's in F1's Forgotten Heroes. Not that he's forgotten. Nobody's forgotten. Just the name of, uh, of a little series I put together. And I hope you're enjoying the series. I really do. I'm certainly enjoying doing it. And um, to all you absolute heroes that are liking, subscribing, uh, and even sharing, and of course you utter legends that are commenting, thank you very much. Really, it means a lot. I find it absolutely wicked. I actually have a new video coming out uh, this week, and I'm sorry there was a bit of a delay between the last ones. It won't happen again, or it might. Uh, new videos, whenever they happen. Um, Alright, well look, I hope you're enjoying it. As I said, thanks again if you're listening all this way. I didn't realise this would be such a long one. Much love, and good luck! New. Yeah.